when we talk about art, uh, the global age, that's when we're talking about the 20th and 21st century. So all of a sudden art became accessible by everyone everywhere very quickly. Uh, you had a lot of technological advances. Uh, we're going to talk about those in a little bit. Um, but there's a lot of things going on in one very short amount of time. And there's a lot of art movements that are going on in a very short amount of time. So we're going to go through quite a few pretty quickly. But when we're talking about uh, art of the 20th and 21st century, uh, we're going to be talking about like history, technological innovations. So aircraft, automobile, radio, telephone, global communication, uh, a fun little thing called a camera. So all of a sudden, artists didn't have to represent something that exactly anymore. They got to do it themselves, uh, which is a fun, fun change. Um, it showed a lot of individuality in artists, a lot of uh, difference um, between what is real and what is more internal. Um, there's a lot of scientific expansion, you know, people just didn't walk down the street and die. Uh, a lot of advancements in psychology, a lot of advancements in physics, um, societal change, large cities, world wars, ideologies, feminism, civil rights movements, multiculturalism. People had rights that didn't have rights before. It's a crazy concept. Um, but with art, we're talking about experimentation using both representation and abstraction. Many styles and approaches, formal elements and or concepts and ideas. Uh, so we're going to be dividing this up between two chunks. We're going to have the modern period, which uh, begins with like Picasso and then like ends with abstract expressionism. The contemporary, which is abstract expressionism until now. But we have the revolution of form and color. We have two bros leading this charge. They're considered the pioneers of modernism. You got Henri Matisse uh, from 1869 until 1954. And Pablo P. Uh, we got Pablo Picasso, 1881 to 1973. Bet you didn't realize he was alive that long. Um, they were very friendly to each other. Uh, a lot of times you think of artists as being very isolated people. Generally, they're not. They work with other people quite a bit. Um, these two worked quite a bit when it came to developing the ideas and expansion of artistic possibilities. Uh, Matisse, you had his rational understanding of color and form, and Picasso, you had his radical versions of form and shape. But first, let's get with our boy Henry. Uh, he was a key figure in the development of modern art. Uh, French artist, 1869 to 1954, we talked about that before. Uh, explored the expressive nature of color and form. He was very influential and had a very unique style. Uh, expressive forms, decorative style, bold use of color. Um, just get into them now. This is Henri Matisse, uh, The Joy of Life from 1905-1906. This is oil on canvas, about six feet by eight feet. So it's a pretty big boy. Um, what stands out immediately to you is like, this doesn't look like the real world. Um, the colors don't really make sense. The forms, figures don't really make sense. Uh, it, not naturalistic, right? Matisse was not interested in copying nature. Uh, nature was already there. Why would he want to cop, cop, uh, copy it? He wanted to make his own thing. Uh, it's a way to express his emotions. I mean, you get different vibes from all these different people down here. Their colors, there's a lot of things being expressed here, whether we like fully understand them or not. Um, and it was about being bold. You know, one of my favorite sayings is subtlety is for cowards. Matisse was very much a fan of that saying. Um, he liked making declarative statements. Here's a quote that he said that I really appreciate. Uh, Matisse said, I did not create a woman. I made a picture. And that's a great idea, right? Uh, he didn't create any thing in here. He made a picture and made a representation of it. So it is an object that is to be looked at and obsessed over maybe it's to be interpreted um compared to you know somebody walking on the street you're like oh it's a person uh this you have to kind of understand a little bit more maybe you get to understand what's happening inside that person's head like what's going on back here guys i don't know so matisse moving on to another piece of his this is the red studio um this is about six feet by seven feet. Now we're looking at the artist's studio here. Um, and it's this very bold, dynamic red color. I can't imagine his studio was actually this red. I, he may have gone insane. 
But this is from 1911. He was alive for like 40 more years. So he, he probably had just like a gray wall. Um, but you can see how the individual artworks in here really stand out. My pointer actually kind of disappeared. But the individual artworks here really stand out because of that intense red in the background flattening the entire picture plane. So it brings importance to what he's working on, almost like it stands out. What's important to him is what he's working on. And that's a really nice like idea. I mean, he could have just painted the room and gone like, oh, look at this nice room. Do you guys want a picture of my room? And someone might say, yes, they probably wouldn't. But the, the, the idea is that it's there already for them. Um, no, no, he's like, that's not important. The room's not important. What's important is the artwork, okay? I want you to look at that. I want you to stare at it. I want you to just look at how I view my room, where the blank space, the negative space doesn't matter. What the only thing that matters is what I'm working on, which is a very nice idea. So this is uh, Henry later in life. Um, he had cancer later in life, specifically uh, related to being exposed to chemicals. You know, being a painter is not a very glamorous position. Uh, but his motor skills had completely like deteriorated. He had a lot of assistants that helped him out. And so he made like paintings or drawings by using scissors. Now here's Icarus. Um, and he used cutouts to make the thing. He was confined to a wheelchair, so he really couldn't move around that much. He began to present cutouts as completed of works of art. So he was drawing with scissors. I've talked a lot about how the importance of drawing is the act of mark making. Matisse was really up in that. He was just like, I'm going to cut it up. Uh, he used cutouts to design tapestries, interior stained glass windows, like anything. Anything he could get his hands on. He didn't want to let his disability, his sickness, limit him in any way. He wanted to keep making artwork as finished as he wants to, which is a really, really interesting idea. It's like the creative spirit of him just would never die until he died. Um, yeah, and then you can look at the specific artwork of this. You got the red heart contrasted by the primary colors around it. While they're not complementary colors, they do intensify each other quite a bit just because of their location on the color wheel. Uh, you can really get a real sense of like Icarus here. You hear the story, boom, you got it. My boy's fallen. Um, but very clean, efficient, refined way. That pretty much covers Matisse. So now we're going to talk about Pablo Picasso um, and uh, someone named Georges Braque. Georges Braque and Picasso worked pretty much in tandem uh, to develop the idea of cubism. So cubism was 1908 to 1914. It emphasized geometry instead of illusionism. And the idea with it is that you are creating a world kind of, uh, specifically cubism is about creating a world that is being seen by multiple viewpoints, multiple advantages. And it is meant to be just kind of like looked at and understood that we are seeing something from multiple angles. Uh, Pablo Picasso a Spanish artist, he left behind his academic training and representational art, explored experimentation, experimental approaches, radical handling of form and shape. Uh, he was very revolutionary and just continued to innovate his entire career, which lasted until he died, uh, until he was much, much older. Um, it was a radical handling of form and shape, um, like just bonkers stuff. He was just making crazy things that people had never seen before. George Brock, who's his friend, kind of helped develop some of these initial ideas for cubism about understanding what's important whenever we're looking at a picture plane. Now, this is Pablo Picasso. Um, I'm not even going to try to say that. I'm awful at French. Um, this is in 1907, uh, eight feet by about eight feet. So very square. Some of you would probably be chilling with that. Uh, but Picasso, this is a revolutionary experimentation with the human figure. Uh, simplified forms into abstract planes. Blue planes in the background clash with the area of the figures. You had the blue and the red in the background just kind of setting us up almost like curtains. So we could view the entire picture plane in a very straightforward way. And now when you look at this, I mean, this thing is taller than you, much taller than some of you. <laughs> so you could see the entire thing when he stood back and really just got to take it all in. Now, he was working with female figures. Uh, we have the two in the center, very simplified, but probably the most like recognizable as a person. Um, 
The two standing on the left and right, the ones that are standing, are the heads of have heads of African masks. Something that was important at this time. We talk about globalization. Was people in Europe are going, oh man, there's a bunch of artwork in other places. I want to look at it. Africa is huge. Maybe we should take a look at more artwork from that. And then they were like, what? We all come from Africa. We should definitely take a look at that. Again, radical viewpoints where the whole world is informing what you're making. The seated figure in the bottom right is probably the most abstract face with one eye seen in profile and one from the front. So we're seeing almost two to three different angles of the same person. Uh, although the abstracted, the figures are still recognizable as people. And that's a really important thing. We see them as people, but they are also some sort of different interpretation. Like the arms are up in a strange way. Their bodies are very changed. And again, we could have just had these people. I mean, Picasso drew from live models. We could have just had him taking a picture of it and been good. But this is different. This is an understanding of what can make an art piece an art piece. George Brock, or George Brock was a big fan of houses. Um, this is Houses at Ellis Stock from 1908. Again, we're still in cubism here. Uh, we feel very cuby with this, right? Uh, the houses become stacked golden cubes and pyramids. Trees and shrubs recognizable but abstracted. So we can see the trees. We can see the houses. We can see the shrubs. But they're not the most detailed things in the world. We get it. We, like, I got it. I got you. Um the focus on underlying shapes and the overall pattern. So it has a rhythm to it. It moves. It moves upwards. It's kind of in, like lifting you up. Like you take a deep breath whenever you look at this. I'm not saying you should just hold your breath the entire time. But when you just breathe in and take a look, it's very uplifting. It can make you just understand that we're seeing multiple viewpoints of every house where we're eliminating windows. It's almost like cardboard box feeling to it. Um. Yeah, very much based in nature. That was the difference between Brock and Picasso. Picasso liked peeper, people. Uh, Brock liked uh, items. Um, now we see them start to synthesize moving forward and what they're working on. But let's take one quick jump back at what the, the final version of this is. Um, now we got one last uh, uh, P.D. Pablo piece here. Um, Gertrude Stein as an art patron. Uh, Gertrude Stein and Leo Stein were art collectors among the first patrons of progressive modern artists. Gertrude held weekly salons in her studio apartment in Paris, introduced Picasso and Matisse to one another. Uh, this was a really important idea. This was the idea that an artist could meet other artists and they could make artwork together separate under kind of an umbrella of security. Uh, 1500s, 1600s, 1400s. Art was all commissioned by the church, big, super rich people. Now you had people who were just independently wealthy uh, deciding to support the arts for the future's sake. Uh, you had Gertrude here um, found a way to kind of help support these artists, maybe when they weren't making as much work, they weren't making as much money by commissioning portraits of herself, portraits of other people, uh, but as a way of helping them out quite a bit. Um, and instead of an artist being kind of shackled to one specific thing, like, you know, Michelangelo and the Pope, you know, Michelangelo only made artwork for the Pope. Now you had Picasso making art for dozens of people around town at the same time. They were all very independently financial, financially wealthy people that he could use as a way of um, making artwork and continuing what he's working on. Uh, this was an earlier piece uh, in the, the Cubism time frame, so he's... The nose is awkward, the mouth is awkward, the eyes are awkward, but it's he's starting to get the idea of seeing something from the same viewpoint. It's a really uh, efficient idea. All right, so let's get into Expressionism. Expressionism, 1905 to 1920, runs a little bit with Cubism. Uh, expressionists explored ways of portraying emotions to their fullest intensity. Exaggerating and emphasizing colors and shapes, departing from direct representation, focusing on inner states of being, finding your, uh, your center. What is inside of you? Uh, when you're doing a painting, doing an art piece, you can try to represent the thing that's out there, but is, what import is what's inside of you important? Uh, they would like to say, yes, um, I know not everybody is super important necessarily, but you all have some sort of specific viewpoint. And expressionists used that 
uh, specific viewpoint, that specific background. They all come from different areas to kind of uh, gather together under the guise of expressionism as a way of just like, what is art? And they're like, art is about expression. Um, just like how the uh, impressionists were, they never called themselves the impressionists, but they were just like, it's impressionism because it's an impression of something. Same idea. Um, Self-portraits were a way to explore the greatest variety and intensity of emotions. They could look into themselves now, right? They could figure out what's inside of them. Um, but that isn't to just say they did that for the, you know, the heart of it. I mean, there was also kind of poor, the cheapest model you have is yourself in a mirror. Um, so trying to capture themselves is really important. So this is Paula Moderson Becker um, self-portrait with camellia. So that's that flower plant in the middle. Um, German expressionist, uh, one of the first women to make nude self-portraits. I mean, just like the idea of, of uh, seeing that in public was kind of a shocking thing at the time. They're like, what? A woman with an opinion? Yeah, right? Big, big mood. Um, but a self-portrait with camellia, very flattened forms reduced details, heavy outlines, solid geometry. So if you draw a line directly down the middle, it's gonna go right over their nose, maybe vertically. Uh, but it, it feels very blocky and organized in a way, but it still gives you room for more abstraction and free form and how the brush strokes were applied. Um, very much so when we looked at before, but influenced by Paul Cezanne and Paul Gauguin. Uh, you know how much I love Gauguin, think about the Yellow Christ painting about how it can very, be very simplified things, but it can convey a lot of emotion just from the simplicity of it. Um, this balances the subtleties in gesture and mood with physical presence. When you're looking at this, I want you to think about whenever they were making the piece. Um, like the eyes, the mouth, the nose, there's a very simplified form happening here. I want you to just take a moment, I want you to look into its eyes, Now I want you to travel down, look at the discoloration of the neck. We get the idea of a shadow without having to be perfectly shaded. We get the weird claw-like hand at the bottom holding the camellia up. There is a certain something to this that just draws you in and keeps you there. Uh, Paula Moderson Becker's work has changed drastically throughout their career, but this is a pretty good example of the beginning of expressionism. Well, bam, completely different now. All right, this is Vasily Kandinsky. Uh, so when we're talking about expressionism, it changes from artist to artist. What is inside that artist trying to talk, okay? So Vasily Kandinsky, this is improvisation number 30 in uh, canons in the little bracket um, from 1913. So in the lower right, you can kind of see something that kind of looks like canons. I'm not really... But Vasily Kandinsky, first off, dope name. Second off, Russian Expressionist. He was a pioneer of non-objective artwork. Now, non-objective, when we talk about what non-objective means, means you can't objectively make anything out of it, okay? So non-objective exists just as a thing to look at. Abstraction could be very recognizable, like when we looked at the painting before by Paula. Uh, you can still recognize a person very clearly in it. Non-objective is just more... It's it's a lot of things going on at the same time. Um, but colors, movements, very dynamic. Uh, he would start his paintings with just nothing. He would just like start with a color and then start moving around from there. Uh, this one was very much influenced by a specific thing while trying not to represent it. Uh, but it was the talk of war in 1913, um, very much leading up to uh, World War One. It reflects the turmoil at the time. Like, what was going on? Like, come on. Like, there's a lot of things happening in this one piece right now. Uh, it was made spontaneously without plan for final outcome. Later artworks are completely devoid of anything recognizable. Like we get the cannons in the lower right. He didn't name it cannons. They kind of look like cannons. It kind of looks like smoke coming out of the cannons. Kind of looks like we got some buildings with a spooky face. And Kandinsky is a really important person in the history of art. I mean, everybody I talk about is important to the history of art or else why else would I be talking about them? Uh, but Kandinsky specifically felt like he knew a lot. And he was very dissatisfied at art education at the time 
uh, like educating these formally trained artists uh, because they weren't covering abstraction. They weren't covering like more modern art movements. So he just wrote um, a book called Art, uh, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, the book itself is a hard read, but the idea of he wrote the book on art. Like how many times do I get to say that about somebody? Um, the only other person who could, you could say wrote the book on art in some way was like Isaac Newton when he detailed everything about color. Uh, so that's a really interesting thing about Kandinsky. He was a very educated academic person making these surreal nightmare scapes. So this is Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. This is Street Berlin. Ernst uh, was a German expressionist. Spoiler. Um, he was part of a group called De Bruck, which uh, meant the bridge in German. Uh, Kirchner's style was very flat planes, intense color, rough, aggressive brushwork. He wanted you to make sure that you knew when you saw this that he made it. Um, now, the figures are very like abstracted, right? But seeing this painting in person is very different. I haven't. But you could see the brushworks. You know, you could see... The, the movement, it's almost like a fingerprint. It's like an idea of the artist and how they approach the picture playing. Uh, it's a very distinct style where people started copying more and more and more to make their own versions of brushwork, their own versions of stylistic choices. Uh, we talk about, uh, what's that guy's name? People like him. Van Gogh, uh, you know, the, the impasto, the built up paint layers, very similar idea, but he was saying very stylized approaches to kind of make, I mean, I could see this being the card for something like a, a movie poster. Uh, and his artwork was very much about art should come from direct experience. Um, a lot of times artists were making artwork and selling them to patrons who just like go, oh, that's nice. He wanted to make artwork that was representative of those people's lives. So he would go to big events. He would paint people live. They would buy it because they were a part of the experience of it. Uh, whenever you think of artwork that's in your house, you may just like it. Um, or you may go, I wish Janet wouldn't have hung that up in the kitchen. But you can appreciate it for what it is. But he was trying to connect with the viewer in a way that put them into the artwork. So they had a direct connection to the artwork because it's something that they existed in. And they may not have viewed that thing they existed in as artwork before. And that's, you know, huge plays. All right, so everything we talked about expressionism, we're now going to just like chew it all up and then throw in a bunch of pictures of pop culture and then just like vomit it out. That This is Dada. Dada was a very interesting art movement that blended later into surrealism and continues now when I think of like all of your weird Shrek memes. Um, Veal very Dada-ist. So it was a movement started in Zurich, Switzerland. It was a reflection to World War I, protested rational thought that had led to war. It's rationals in quotations because a rational minds all got together and go, we need to kill each other as fast as possible. We need to invent new weapons. So they were like going, if that's what rational thought is, we don't want to be rational. Uh, if rationality means that we have to go into hiding and like all of our friends dying, then we don't want to be rational. So the name Dada was chosen at random from the dictionary. I think it just means like that or something. Um, but it was an anti-art movement that refused to be called a movement. So they were very much... Just anti everything. They're like, this is not art. If you guys call it art, you're done. Um, but they existed purely to be the opposite of whatever was before. So again, if whatever was before is what led to World War I, they did not want to be part of that. So uh, it spread to US, Berlin, uh, Cologne, Paris, Russia, you know, all sorts of fun places. Dada works were sculptural objects, performances and events, publications, posters, and pamphlets. Uh, Critical and playful, focus on individuality, irrationally, chance and imagination. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, Dada uh, with a few specific people. Um, first, I wanna talk about Hugo Ball. This is the performance of Caruana. So Caruana was a uh, nonsense poem, um, an experimental sound poem that Hugo Ball had made of just words and sounds and it's more of a performance event it was something to view 
entirely just at the time. Hugo Ball was a German actor and anarchist. He opened the Cabaret Voltaire with Emmy uh, Hennings, um, gathering place for artists and writers. Performances were lively and theatrical. Everyone would take part in it. Um, it would have been just, again, the opposite of rationality. Uh, but what do you expect from a place called Cabaret Voltaire? It's like one of the coolest names I can imagine. Um, but with this, he dressed up like some sort of weird monster uh, lobster thing and recited this poem. And I'm going to read it for you right now. Caruana. Jolifanto bambla o fali bambla. Grossiga empafa habla horum. Dejiga gurman. Higo bielko rusia buja. Holaka halala. And longo bung. Blago bung. Blago bung. Bobo fataka. Ay, 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 ay. Shampa wola wusa olobo. Hey tata gorim. Ishige zumbada. Wanabu susubu wolo susubu. Tumba ba umph. Kusegama ba umph. Now, I want you uh, to just like really take a moment there and uh, fully appreciate Halaka Halala. Um, think about how you would say these things. Um, make maybe your own nonsense poem. Um, think about what that can actually mean for a viewer. I mean, in 1916, if this would have been anywhere major other than the Cabaret Voltaire, they probably would have thrown, you know, rotten uh, cabbages at you. Uh, which was an important idea with this. Uh, it's a, it's a sort of artwork that should make you mad because it's not artwork, right? Speaking of, uh, this is uh, the first of uh, multiple times that we're going to talk about Marcel Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp, you might know from something called The Fountain, which was a urinal that was turned upside down and he signed the name R. Mutt on it. And the idea with it is, uh, how do we appreciate what art is? Um, now, Duchamp was a French artist, but he was living in New York for a long time. He was a Dada, Dadaist. <laughs> he was responsible for three major 20th century art innovations, ready-mades, kinetic sculpture, and conceptual art. So this is one of those ready-mades. And ready-made is what it sounds like. It's some things that were ready, and he made them together. Uh, 1913, um, the assemblage and found objects... Uh, resembles a traditional sculpture with a base and main subject, made because Duchamp enjoyed looking at it. Originals lost, this has been remade twice, subverts the institution and originality of art. So, like we were talking before about Picasso, the originality of art. Do you have to make the thing to call it yours? Like, how, who, how do we decide what something belongs to? So, Duchamp's idea was he can take things, uh, rearrange them, and now they're his. Um, it's a completely different look than what it was before. You recognize the bicycle wheel. You recognize the stool. You recognize the little clamp holding it together. Uh, but it's not immediately identifable as a bike. You might be able to get a stool. But it's its own new thing. And that's the idea with ready Maids with Duchamp. He's making a new thing out of something that already exists. Um, for example, have you drawn a cat? Okay, you didn't invent the cat, but you drew your interpretation of it, right? So you're changing up the narrative of it by putting you into it. So the artist's point of view becomes very important at that point. Not going to talk long about this one, uh, but this John Hartfeld, he was a Berlin Dadaist in 1936. Uh, he made this piece called Have No Fear, He's a Vegetarian. So this is a photo collage of different things to kind of represent something. Um, and you have here, like, the ideas at the time in Germany. It was like, he's not that bad of a guy. I mean, how bad can he be? He's a vegetarian. Well, turns out Hitler can be very bad. Um, and that's, 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 that's the idea of it is it's kind of like 
it's a little bit like tongue in cheek, a little bit funny. Four years after this, uh, uh, they got very much invaded. Um, but it was very, it was, it was pointing out kind of the, the strange sensibilities of the time. Everyone's like, "Yeah, it's fine. What's the worst thing that could happen?" He's a vegetarian. It's like silly. Again, I think of Shrek memes. Surrealism. Uh, the movement began in 1917 in Paris. Uh, it opposed rationality and convention, so very much in the spirit of Dada. Uh, it's based on the ideas of Austrian psychoanalysis Sigmund Freud. You very, may have heard of uh, him. Um, psychoanalysis was about understanding what's inside your brain, um, especially how it relates to your mom. Uh, unconscious mind about what is going on inside your head. So several times today, you may have gone, what happened in the past five minutes? What was I doing? They want to know what was happening in those five minutes inside your brain when apparently the world kept going, but you didn't. Um, that's understanding dreams, you know, like the absurdity of a dream. Like how do we interpret it? Does it mean something? Should it mean something? Like why was it important for me with my hands made out of spiders to help fix my bike with my ex-landlord? I don't know, uh, but apparently it was important enough that my brain decided to make it important. So they're trying to understand that. And there's a lot of fear, a lot of gloom associated with dreams. I can't remember, this might just be a personal thing, I can't remember the last time I had a happy dream. You know, when's the last time the sun shone in my dreams? Anyway, the artwork was very much about uh, challenging the idea of objective reality. Like, what does reality mean? Um, how do you interpret reality? Okay, this is uh, Giorgio de Chirico, The Melancholy and Mystery of the Street. Giorgio is a Greek-born Italian artist, developed his style before surrealism existed. It's an intuitive and irrational approach to painting. Uh, this is The Melancholy and Mystery of the Street. So with this, you're seeing different viewpoints here, right? You're seeing the building on the right and the building on the left have different uh, vanishing points for their architecture. It kind of gives you an immediate sense of dread, uh, to just give the overall impression of like what's going on. Uh, now in the lower left, we can see a figure rolling a little hoop with a stick for some reason. That was a fun game back in the day. Uh, but it gives you a sense of just like cheerful playfulness. But it's entering this world of dread due to the awkward architecture of it. Then in the middle, in the yellow, you can see a figure standing, this, this the shadow of it, giving a sense of upcoming doom. Um, now, that's just kind of an interpretation of it. This narrative remains very unclear. Uh, the dreamlike environment is what seems to be really important, and the, but the vague sense of threat seems to be very important to surrealism uh, going from this moment and interpreting what our dreams actually mean. Uh, speaking of, what does this mean? This is Max Ernst, surrealism, elapse, penture. Uh, Max Ernst was German. Uh, Dadaist and surrealist. Uh, it's made in 1942, so right in the middle of World War II, he's like, guys, bleh, a lot of things going on, but I have got to do this. Um, is held in highest esteem the process of making art. Maybe not the finished art piece itself, but the process of making art was very, very important to him. So collage, rubbing, scraping, wanted to reduce conscious control over the work and liberate the human imagination. Bong. This shows the imagination wandering in the mysterious realm of creativity, which again, the dreamlike state of just existing um, gives a vaguely cosmic abstraction quality, like what happens inside your brain. With this, we get a viewpoint of like what it's like for Ernst to make something, what is going on inside of his head at that time. Jean Moreau, this is object, great name. Uh, is a Spanish surrealist. Uh, this is an assemblage piece, three-dimensional equivalent of a collage. So it's a bunch of things kind of together to give you a sense of, of surrealistic ideas. Or we're talking about Duchamp from before, the ideas of just artwork in general. Um, this was a collection of objects, very whimsical, mysterious, nonsensical. I mean, that birds, like, sitting on top of that piece of wood doesn't much makes sense because uh, it's about to fall off it's inside of a hat that looks like a leg floating there uh, this is the definition of surrealism got a surrealism now the influence of cubism had a huge impact through Europe uh, some artists adopted the cubist style and just did that uh, others explored new approaches not possible for cubism because the idea of cubism was just like 
why, what did they even do beforehand? Um, we're going to talk about one of them. I, I don't really feel like talking about some of the other ones, but futurism is mainly what we're going to talk about. Futurism was very much about the idea of going forward, okay? So moving into the future here. Um, this originally it originated in Italy. It's from 1909 to late 1920s. It was very much influenced by Cubism, crash, clashing planes and geometry. This very much departs from Cubism in a few ways. Celebrated dynamic movement, progress, and modern technology. Like you think of just everything has to move forward. Uh, so futurism, you're thinking of the future. You're never looking back. Like sharks, sharks don't ever look back. Be like a shark, look forward. This aligned with political beliefs that were later to become known as fascist. Ooh. Um, but this expressed the contempt for the past. What was done in the past is boring and terrible. Uh, they only cared about the future. Now, it's funny to talk about something like this in an art history lecture, which is all about the past, but whatever. Umberto Boccioni, very dope name. Uh, this is unique forms of continuity in space. So... You're seeing this, you see the ideas of futurism very clearly, right? This exists in abstracted planes, it moves forward, it's got a dynamic range to it. Uh, the figure is forcefully striding. This was originally made in plaster, um, but the version you're seeing is made in bronze that was cast after his death. Uh, this embodies the words of futurist founder Filippo Marinetti. War is beautiful because it inaugurates the long dreamt of materialization of the human body. I don't know what that means, but it sounds beautiful, right? If you want to think on it some more, go for it. Now, this is probably my favorite art piece of, um, what's it called? All time. This is Marcel Duchamp. This is New Descending a Staircase number two. Uh, as far as I know, uh, and again, a lot of art history is what your art history teacher told you. I remember my art, his, my art history teacher saying there was no new descending the staircase one or three or four. He named it that way just to be mysterious. Again, not fact checked. Um, but this is from 1912. This is a uh, oil on canvas, pretty big, about 60 inches. Um, this combines cubism geometry with futurism's emphasis on movement. Uh, if you take a Picasso piece, we think of the the landscape, or the, not the landscape, uh, but the, the still life on the table with the bottle of uh, Suze. All right, now we take that and we just, we hit it with a train. That is Marcel Duchamp's version of futurism. Um, I want you to take a moment, look at it. Now I want you to think of your bro, your pal, your compadre, walking down some stairs. Okay, now I want you to take a step to the right have them walk down the stairs. Take another step to the right. Have them walk down stairs. Go back a little bit to the left. Walk down stairs. Do this over and over and over again. And then hit it with a bomb. And that is kind of the essence of what Duchamp was doing with this painting. He was trying to show radical movement happening with a very stationary, dull subject matter. Um, and again, it goes back to his original thing of like, who makes art? Who's going to decide what art is? Um, well, I will say... This was part of a huge European art show. It was supposed to introduce America to modernity. And it happened at something called the Armory Show in New York in 1913. And they emphatically said, this is not art. <laughs> uh, I don't care if you're an artist. Um, America at this time, very much into landscapes and paintings of horses, and George Washington's hair, and the uh, radicalization of artwork in Europe at the time was something they were just like, no thanks. Woodrow Wilson, president at the time, uh, famously said, this artwork wasn't fit to be a rug in his bathroom. Now, I want you to think of your rug in your bathroom. I want you to think about how it is the least important thing in your house. It is important for one moment, and that's when you, you need to step out of the shower, but and it gets moldy, it gets gross, it is a very disposable thing, right? So he's like saying it's not even fit to be disposable. Love to see it. Another critic said, uh, this looks like an explosion at a shingles factory, which is super on brand for Marcel Duchamp. Uh, but people consider this dangerous, threatening, even criminal. They were like, you need to go to jail, Marcel, um, which is a... I, 
guess, a thought. Uh, you wouldn't expect that to come from the free country of America in the early 1900s, uh, but that's how they viewed it at the time. One little interesting note while we're on this page as you're writing notes, uh, Marcel Duchamp uh, eventually quit art um, to become a world champion chess player uh, because uh, Marcel Duchamp gonna Marcel Duchamp. 